There are so many ways to die at this conference. That's a first, I think. <laughs> All right, so I get the pleasure of not only opening this event, uh, but getting up here and talking about board games for 45 minutes. Uh, the title of this talk is What Board Games Can Teach Us About Designing Experiences, which is already kind of a mouthful, uh, but it's actually not super accurate. So before we get too far along, I need to fix the title. Um, so first, it's really about what designing board games, um, it's not just playing, but also designing them, uh, can teach us. Uh, also, for those of you who are game nerds and enjoy good games like this, you realize board games, you know, while it's a popular term, isn't the accurate one. So the accurate one is actually tabletop games, because it can include board games, as well as card games, as well as other types of games as well. Um, and then finally, um, you know, we can't design experiences. There's that whole semantic debate. So designing for experiences, just to, you know, put that uh, tribe to, uh, at ease. So anyway, this is a talk about UX and board games. And, you know, there are lots of good UX, what UX can learn from types of articles and talks out there. And, you know, this could have just as easily been what UX can learn from Lego bricks, uh, what UX can learn from motorcycle maintenance. What UX can learn from Marvel Comics. I'm sure there's a talk out there. Uh, what UX can learn from baking bread. I'm sure you could do something about the craft of that. And while all of these would be interesting talks, my question is, would they be useful or would they be relevant to our craft? And so the first thing I want to just say um, before I get up and give a talk about board games and UX is um, I don't think this is because I'm interested in games and I found a connection then, you know, between what I do uh, in my day work. Um, I actually do think if you were to draw the Venn diagram between board game design or game design in general and UX, there's a really, really significant overlap. So why tabletop games? So one, uh, uh, clickers. <laughs> rich, nuanced, engaging experiences. If that's our focus, if we're trying to create these rich, nuanced, engaging experiences, I think games, particularly modern board games, are an incredible place to look to for ideas. So when I talk about modern board games, talk about things like Settlers of Catan, Ticket to Ride, Seven Wonders, Codenames, Pandemic, these types of games. And what's happened over the last 5, 10, 15 years is the game market has matured, and you know, one great game comes out one year, but then the next year a new game iterates on it and improves on it and just makes it that much better. And so things like, that game was good, but there was downplay and I had to wait for my turn again, gets fixed in the next iteration or next evolution of that game theme. There's different mechanics, different ideas, things being tried, and they're all creating this intense emotional engagement. And I had this moment where uh, I was listening to Matt Leacock, the game designer of Pandemic, talk about uh, uh, what he does. And he says, I still practice UX, I just do it with cardboard now. And when he said that, there was this moment where I was like, wow, I can sit down at a table and get super engaged, emotionally invested in this cardboard and paper. Like, that is pretty remarkable. So what's going on here? Because it's more than cardboard and paper. So second, I would say, why tabletop games? Because it's our job. And the reason I say that is, is I actually prefer this definition of experience design or description from Jesse James Garrett, which he says, experience design is the design of anything independent of medium or across media with human experience as an explicit outcome and human engagement as an explicit goal. And just to be fair, again, going back to that, you know, maybe because I'm really into games, I found these connections. I did look across about four or five dozen other adjacent fields. And you look at things like even film, for example, and there's a lot of overlap between film and what we do, but there are some critical differences. Film, for example, is a passive activity. It's not interactive. Uh, you could look at, you know, behavioral economics, which I've done. You could look at graphic novels and find comparisons. But I think you look at game design, and like I said, that Venn diagram overlap is really, really significant. And you know, just to check myself, like, am I alone on this? You know, I started reaching out to other folks, and my friend Christina Woodkey, she teaches interaction design in California, and she says, you know what? If I just skip past interaction stuff and teach game design, I can cover 80% of everything that I need to cover. I can talk about affordances, and I can talk about uh, discoverability. I can talk about all these things by teaching game design, and the students enjoy it a whole lot more. 
And I love this quote from her. She says, game design and interaction design are fraternal twins. They share almost all their DNA. All right, so let's get into the meat of this. What then can we learn from tabletop games? And as I started researching and investigating this, like ideas started coming, I started seeing a bazillion connections. So some of these connections, let me, uh, let me just put them out in front of you. We are not gonna go over all of these, uh, but started seeing things like a focus on the whole, onboarding, user engagement, um, how do you sustain engagement? How do you deal with emotions? Uh, tactility, the whole tangible part, especially as increasingly our interactions are less about screens, more about tangible things. All sorts of things we could talk about, but I'm going to limit myself just five topics today, uh, the ones that I thought were most interesting uh, uh, to, to focus on given the time. So let's start with this first one, experience-driven orientation. And this is something I think all of us talk about. I've been talking about it since uh, 2006, at least, with this model I created. Uh, this was based after Maslow's hierarchy of needs where you talk about things moving up through different levels from functional, useful, to reliable, to usable, to convenient, pleasurable, and finally meaningful. And while that's one part of the model that's important, to me the more critical part of this model has always been the stuff at the bottom and the top. And that's what is your orientation. And I think in the early days of a product, your orientation is going to be more about tasks and products and things like that. But at some point, you've got to change your orientation and make it more of an experience focus. If you want to get past that certain level of maturity, you've got to change fundamentally how you're looking at the problem you're solving. And when you do that, there's a shift. Instead of talking about tasks and features, you start talking about people, activities, and context. Instead of talking about output and functionality, you talk about outcomes and experiences. And instead of talking about things like interfaces or interactions or usability, you talk about things like perceptions, emotions, attention, memory, because this is the material we work with when we're talking about human beings and human experience. So if we shift over to the game design world, there's a very famous model called MDA. It stands for Mechanics, Dynamics, and Aesthetics. And it was written at a time when uh, game designers were very frustrated that you know, people would ask, what's the value of a game? Why do we do game design? And the answer was always, because games are fun. Well, that was a rather shallow, superficial answer. And so a team of folks came together to, to really unpack that. What do we mean by fun? Uh, what, what, what is that? What are the types of fun we're talking about? And out of that conversation also came this idea that, you know, we usually think of games as starting with the mechanics and the rules and pushing it out into the world. But really, we should start with the end, this, these types of fun, the aesthetics, and work backwards. And I love this quote. He could replace the word player with user, and it's, it would be written for our audience, for us. Thinking about the player, user, encourages experience-driven as opposed to feature-driven design. As such, we begin our investigation with a discussion of aesthetics and continue on to dynamics, finishing with the underlying mechanics. And so to give you an example of this, uh, this is a, a prototype of a game. Uh, it had been shopped around to many publishers, a lot of whom had passed on it. And I think there was a, a lightly pasted on theme of, of like collecting bouquets of flowers, you know, something along those lines. Uh, but, you know, a lot of publishers, like I said, passed on it. Well, a good friend of mine, Randy Hoyt, who you'll see several quotes from in this talk, uh, he's a game publisher, and he looked at the game, he played it, and he said, you know what, I really think there's potential in this game. Like, this game is actually fun, it's just obviously missing a lot, it needs to be taken to the next level. And so uh, he, he talks on a, in a blog post about, uh, about you know, the development process for this game, and he says, the key was to go down a level deeper. At work, we were doing a branding exercise for a product, and we listed off the adjectives we wanted to describe the product. I realized that a similar exercise would work here. I mulled over all the feedback on the mechanics. What types of experience were they creating on their own? What adjectives did players use to describe the mechanics? Players described the game as, and listen to these words, simple and elegant. It was calming and relaxing to play. They were surprised and delighted by the richness of the decisions. They said it flowed smoothly and that they could play it over and over again. So I'm going to call out the specific adjectives there in this quote. Simple, elegant, calming, relaxing, 
richness flowed smoothly. He had all these ideas floating around. He said, you know, when I played the game, this is what it felt like. When people played the game, this is what they said. But it needed a theme. It needed something else to, to move the game forward. So like many creative endeavors, he put it in the back of his mind and went about other things. And it was about three months later when he was with some friends and their kids were watching uh, some uh, Disney shows on TV and Tangled came on. And he saw this scene in the movie Tangled and he was like, that's it. He saw that, you know, all these lanterns floating. And he says, this image captured perfectly the feeling that playing the game produced. And I knew a theme and narrative woven around this would work to produce a great experience. That game went on to become this game called Lanterns. It's been a kind of an international bestseller. It's been translated in multiple languages, has won a ton of awards. It's just a beautiful game, very elegant, very fun to play. And that was the aesthetic. That was the feeling that he was going for, was elegant. Elegant in like a beautiful, calming way. So that's one game. Let's contrast this with another game. It's also a very popular one, Pandemic. Any of you have played Pandemic before? All right, I see quite a few hands going up. Uh, so Pandemic is quite different. It's, uh, you're trying to stop the outbreak of four deadly viruses that threaten to wipe out the population of the Earth. Um, so the feelings here would be things like anxiety and stress. And what I love about this game is when you're playing it, as cities start piling up with more of these blocks, which signals you know, an outbreak is going to come up, you actually feel a lot of stress and anxiety. And, you're like, should I do this thing? Well, if I do it, it's risky and there might be an outbreak. Or should I send the medic there to remove a cube? What do I do? And one of the things I love is when they ported this game to the iPad, um, they managed to capture and enhance these same feelings through the animation, through the sounds, through the video, um, th or through the motion. And so I got a clip here, a video clip, from uh, near the end of the game when you're playing Pandemic. And I think you'll feel the anxiety that I'm talking about. So here we go. Hearts beating at this moment. Yeah, so that's the experience this game creates. Completely different focus uh, uh, in our intentions. So the question or the takeaway for us and what we do is how often do we let or really let a singular desired experience drive every product decision? And when I say every product decision, let me unpack that. Adding features, eliminating features, pushing back on customer requests. A little anecdote there. While I was playtesting Lanterns with uh, Randy, I get, would give him feedback and say, so I think you should add like, more of a catch-up mechanic here where I can race out ahead when I'm behind and do these things. And he smiled and was like, that's a different game. That's not the game I'm trying to build. I want it to be more of an elegant, flowing game. So you might make a slow catch-up, but you wouldn't catch up very quickly. I'm like, oh, OK. So he had this product vision, this game vision, and he was filtering feedback through that lens. Prioritizing the backlog how we design a familiar feature, delaying releases, because the feeling isn't right, just right. And on that note, there's a, there's a sentiment popular in the game design world. Until my players feel blank, I will not ship. Meaning until the game creates this feeling in the players, I will not release the product. And here's a quote again from Christina. Games often ship late because they ship based on exit criteria, not deadlines. Either you ship something tiny before you run out of money, or you ship late something that is sufficiently fun. The first are higher risk, but if the core works, they'll make it. And that's a big theme in game design, is making sure you know what your core is. What is the central piece and building out from there? It's not about shipping pieces of the game, it's finding what the core is and then spiraling out from there. And so that leads to the next topic, which is a focus on the whole. And this is something I've really picked up on as I've been designing games, is just how much they are a system. And every little detail and every change ripples throughout and can affect the entire game. 
in good or bad ways. So to uh, bring this home for what we do, um, I've got this image up here. I want you to look at it for a minute and see if you can figure out what this is or might be. Let me bring it together for you here. Tigger! <laughs> All right, so this, is a, this would be an example of Gestalt psychology where the whole is other than the sum of the parts. Um, not the whole is better than the sum of the parts, as was mistranslated for many decades, but the whole is other than the sum of the parts, meaning, you know, there's all the pieces and the parts, and they're important, but how the parts come together into a whole is also equally important, and it's an altogether different thing. And if I was to translate this for us, I would say an experience is other than the sum of the parts. So why is this important? So imagine this is your backlog. These are the 20 or 25 features that you have slated to build, and you start churning them out, one sprint after another, and then somewhere along the way, the product finally gets released, and this is it. <laughs> and I think as designers and holders of the vision, we're, <laughs> we're, we're like, wait a second, that's, 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 not, uh, that's not this. That's what we had talked about. And you know, the pieces are the same, um, in fact, some may even point out there's, we cut some scope there, right? Uh, the features are the same, but the final experience here is just wrong. And this is what I'm talking about when I say having a systems view or a view of how the whole comes together, how the parts come together for a whole. And I think this on the right, this whatever it is, scary thing, is more likely to come about when you have an extreme product focus, a feature focus. I think you get the vision you're after when you have an experience focus, this top-down version. And if we look across other disciplines, you see the same thing. You hear words like production, direction, balance, orchestration, choreography. All these words have to do with making sure the whole is well-adjusted, well-balanced for an intended effect. This was something I experienced firsthand at the GDC Game Design Workshop, which was where I really dove into prototyping a game, and I realized we'd make one small tweak to the rules, and the game would crash and derail, or, or it would ripple throughout the system and just change the gameplay completely. Because this is a uh, design conference, you have to have at least one Steve Jobs quote, so here you go. Designing a product is keeping 5,000 things, so there are your pieces, 5,000 things in your brain and fitting them all together, there's the whole, in new and different ways to get what you want. And every day you discover something new that is a new problem or a new opportunity to fit these things together a little differently. And, that, and it's that process that is the magic. So for us, what can we take from this? Well, I would ask, do your processes encourage a focus on the whole? and how all parts fit together. And, and just, to, just to bring this home even more, this is uh, Dave Maloof, and also an interaction designer, and, and he says, he's talking about like people focusing on the colors of buttons and things, and he says, now imagine a different scenario where the designer never actually addressed the color of any of the buttons at all. Instead, they presented their complete vision where real people experienced a complete system with satisfaction. The question of a simple hypothesis of whether or not a color button would be good or bad would be completely ignored. Why? Because the story version of the presentation focuses on the experience people will have and the value they will hopefully receive from the holistic design. Instead of focusing on the individual featured components, any one of which is quite meaningless by themselves. So, Back to my challenge. Do your processes encourage a focus on the whole and how all parts fit together for a desired effect? And let's unpack this. What gets defined as a release? Is it a complete set of things or is it parts of a bigger whole? What is the critical core to your experience? What do you measure? Do you measure outcomes and holistic experiences or do you measure individual pieces and parts? Does your team consider how new features might play with or disrupt existing features? In software design, I see us release feature after feature, never thinking about other features we've released in the past and how they might work together or not, as is more often the case. Do you test small parts or do you test the entire experience? And what's the scope? As designers, what's the scope of the projects you take on? 
I encourage all my designers to really focus on taking on more epics and themes and bigger, broader sets of projects and to try to steer clear of stories and tasks because they tend to pull us into focused on pieces. And you see this theme in, uh, in some of these MVP models. I'm not a fan of a lot of them, but I actually like this one. This is the cupcake cake wedding cake model from Brandon Shower. And what I like about this is in each iteration, it is a whole, it's a complete thing. The cupcake is the smallest version of your product. The cake is a bigger version, and the wedding cake is the biggest. But in each case, it's a complete experience. This is very different from what he cautions against, which is, hey, let's build a cake and release a cake, right? Just the, just the batter, right? Oh, let's release the filling for the next release. And then let's release the icing. In those cases, you're not releasing a complete experience. You're releasing parts of a experience. And he cautions against that. All right, so let's lead into another topic, playtesting. So I spoke with a lot of game designers and did some research. And again, I've been designing games on, uh, on my own as well. And here's the typical process for game design. You have an idea. And it is an idea until you actually put it in front of people and you play it. And I, I myself have been guilty of like having the idea and mocking up a logo for it and some nice looking cards and showing what it would look like. And weeks and months will go on, but I've never actually played a game. And there's a very popular sentiment in game design, which is until you put it on the table, it is not a game. It does not exist. Until you can play it with other people, it doesn't exist. So when the game is complete enough to begin playing, which oftentimes is within hours or days of having the concept, you start playing with it. And it's very rough. It's often scribbles or sticky notes or, or you know, uh, uh, colored dots on pieces of paper. And you play test, usually with a trusted, close inner circle of friends. And you focus on iterating until there's actually a game there, until there's actually a core, something that's actually fun and engaging. It's not perfect. There's lots of rough edges, but you've got a core to start from. And at that point, you start bringing in your outer circle of friends or people in your broader network and people who are OK with things that are fuzzy and ambiguous and kind of rough. And the goal there is you've got a core, but let's see where it breaks. Let's uh, smooth out the edges. Let's, um, let's try and break the game. Let's do things like that. And then you play test with random strangers. And this is where you as the designer are no longer present. You're not explaining the game or making up rules on changes on the fly. You're actually you know, handing people written directions, handing them over, and then stepping back and watching what happens. Or mailing out copies of your game in the mail and hoping people enjoy the game without you being present. So you're testing the rule book. You're testing onboarding, things like that. And again, there's a theme that comes up over and over again. Test whatever you can as soon as you can. Learn whatever you can along the way. Here's another quote that I thought was fascinating, talking about the process. And uh, the game designer in this case, Jim Fitzpatrick, said, now here we are eight months later, and it, the game, has changed quite a bit. And yet, it is essentially the same thing. So there's that core, but he's ironed out all these little details. It's changed because I listened and learned to recognize some of the things wrong with it. And he listened and learned by iterating constantly all the time with people. So let's look at our own processes. I did a Google search for design processes, UX processes, and just you know, grabbed the top five or six that came back. And here are the processes going from left to right. And what I wanted to look at was when do we actually bring users into the process to actually iterate and play with something that's sort of a semi-complete whole. And you know, it was pretty sad. In most cases, we do it near the end, like when we're 70% complete. And so to this, I would say, to what extent do you include users throughout the entire design and development process? How early in the process are users able to play with a semi-complete version of your product? Do you start with the core experience and then move out? And we were talking about this at work and talking about it with my design team. and. I got to the whiteboard, and I drew this on the board for everyone. I said, OK, imagine you've got time going across one side, and you've got fidelity of the product, the thing you're going to ship. Here's what I see being taught in most design schools, and here's what I see being practiced in cases where there's a lot of UX process. I see a lot of people spend time doing things like user research, creating personas from that user research, doing customer journeys, service maps, doing all these abstract things, and maybe start to get to more tangible things like a wireframe, and then a mood board, and then copywriting over in your Word doc. But 
up until this point, nothing has actually come together in a whole that someone could actually respond to and see how it's all going to come together. So it does come together at some point, and there's this point at which there's sufficient fidelity to get good feedback. And it's at that point, I see this over and over again, people say, oh, when you showed me that mood board, I didn't think it would look like this in the, in the actual mock-up. Or, oh, now that I'm seeing the copy and layout, we need to change it. Like, this doesn't make, this doesn't make sense. And, uh, and you see all these edits, but, you know, the integrated experience is presented too late in the process to make any real substantial changes. You've got very little time left because you've been doing a lot of abstract work, which is all good, but is there another way? Well, this is how I've been working for the last decade or so. I try to get to something reasonable fidelity right away, as early on in the process. And I'm going to stop right there. A lot of people who've gone through a design school will freak out at this moment and say, you're skipping all the important research and all the important steps. Absolutely not. Because what's critical to this is you're still doing research and learning, but you're doing it at a much higher fidelity, and you're iterating like you would with a game at a higher fidelity, and you're getting much better feedback. And I would say you get to something tangible much sooner, leading to better research and better iterative feedback. All right, so let's take a, a detour and talk about something completely different. So those first three things are kind of conceptual and more about process and vision and prototyping and those types of things. Uh, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, and it's, uh, it's use of space. And in the book I'm working on right now, I, I have several chapters dedicated to visual encodings, to uh, spatial arrangement, how we arrange things in space to hold meaning. And just to make sure we're all anchored on what I mean by this, uh, I remember a year or two ago, I was, I was locked in this chapter and stuck and couldn't figure out how to get unstuck, and I was having lunch with a friend, and he works in a really obscure sector of healthcare with pharmaceutical companies, and he was trying to explain his company and how they sit in relationship to the five biggest providers that no one has ever heard of because they're behind the scenes and all this. And he reached out and grabbed these salt and pepper shakers and the Tabasco sauce and started arranging it. And then he took the sugar packets and moved them and said, this is like the flow of money. What he was doing was using space and using these objects to create a visual representation. And this is what we're doing when we create data visualizations or when we create infographics or when we create any of these visual representations of information. We've got objects, we put them onto a space, and we move them around or interact with them, and we convey meaning or hold meaning in that way. And if you think about it, and this is a quote from uh, Barbara Tversky, who's written about this. She says, before the page, there was space itself. Perhaps the simplest way to use space to communicate is to arrange and rearrange things within it. And we do this naturally. When you're packing for a trip, like I just did, I arrange things on the bed before I put them into my suitcase. Right? Or if we're cooking a complex recipe with lots of ingredients, we'll maybe push the ingredients, the spices we've added, we'll push them to, to the back of the counter to, to signal that we've already added that to, to the pot, right? We use space all the time in different ways. Sorting laundry, we'll sort laundry into different piles before we, we do the laundry. We use space to hold and convey meaning. So this is one of the things I love about board games is their incredibly rich use of space to hold meaning. So here you walk up to this game, this game called Avanon, and you look at it and you're like, I know there's some meaning there, but what is the meaning, right? Why those cards aren't just arbitrarily laid on the table. And yeah, in this game, you've got tracks, if you will, and you're trying to push cards away from you toward the other player or vice versa. Um, that's the spatial meaning there. Or if you look at a game like Catan, you have to go there with me uh, and imagine this, but when you're, one of the most intense parts of the game is at the very beginning when you're picking where you're going to put your, your starting uh, settlements. And I, I had this day with, where I was looking at it through the lens of like data visualization and thinking about like betting in Las Vegas on the roulette. And it's a lot like that, except you've got this giant multi-dimensional heat map that I've never seen any sort of visualization equivalent. Uh, in our screen designs, but that's essentially what you're doing, which makes it so intense and complex. Um, here's a game, Innovation. You see all these cards arranged in a circle, and you're like, what, what does that mean? And if you play the game, you're journeying through time as you go along the circle. Star Realms. 
You know, you walk up, and again, it's like, ah, I know these cards have some meaning, but what is it? And when you start to learn the game and play it, you learn that there's this shared space between the two players. There's the other player's space, and then there's my space, right? So that's the, that's the biggest bracket or biggest cluster. Uh, and then, you know, within that shared space, there are things like the scrap heap, uh, where cards that are out of the game go. There's basic explorer cards. There's the trade row that continually gets replenished that you draw from. There's the trade deck that you draw from to replenish the trade row. And then as far as the cards that are in play, it changes every turn, but there's the draw deck, there's the discard deck, there's cards played this turn, there's cards that will persist after turns in the form of bases. So suddenly there's all this meaning that is entirely understood by the players based on where they place the cards. So all of that to say, spatial arrangement can be an incredibly powerful signal of meaning. So now we turn our, turn our attention back to UI design and product design. And this example is now 10 years old, and I'm sad to say nothing has changed during that time frame. Uh, this was me shopping for digital point-and-click cameras in 2007. And I have a problem with this view right here. It's the grid view. And it masquerades as something really meaningful and visual. Because look, you can see all the photos, right? But if you abstract and take away some of the text, you've got this wonderful opportunity where you have all these objects. Think of them as cards, but the arrangement means nothing. But you could arrange it on XY metrics, and suddenly you would understand your camera options better. You could get a little more complex and put it on something sort of radial with these, these uh, tr three areas, right? You could just do a simple stack. A simple rank order would help me make sense of my options. Or, you know, all sorts of crazy things you could do. Go pseudo depth, right? Or use uh, you, all, just all sorts of wonderful things we could do, and we don't. And it, it frustrates me when I see all these wonderful, rich ways we could use spatial arrangement to hold meaning, and we're just not using it. I do an all-day workshop on this, and um, I brought in a personal frustration last year where I was shopping for a car. And frankly, I didn't know the differences between the makes and models, and even within particular one, one model, all the varieties and flavors of that car. And so I said, I want you to create the visualization that will help me shop for a car. And so the first thing we do is we cut up all of these options, these cards, and I say, just put them out on the table, and think about how you naturally arrange them and how you chunk them into groups or how you sort them. Now, show me how you would create an interface that lets me do that. So my challenge here, how are you using space and the spatial arrangement of information in your work? All right, so you're maybe going with me at this point saying, okay, there's lots to learn from board games, lots of stuff I could bring back. There is one you know, constant concern that's brought up over and over again, and that's like you know, a fundamental difference between games and product design, and that is this topic of friction. And what I hear over and over again is games are fundamentally about creating friction, otherwise you don't have a game, whereas what we do is we're about removing friction. And you see this sentiment uh, a lot. So here's Riff Koster. Uh, game designer, he says, UX design is about removing problems from the user. Game design is about giving problems to the user. Uh, Randy Hoyt, people play games for no productive reason. You go out and you, you put up with unnecessary obstacles. Dirk Niemeyer, the friction is the game. In UX, a lot of what I did was around eliminating friction. Friction is almost always bad and only sometimes strategically good. You're just ruthless about getting rid of it. In games, it's the total opposite. Whenever I'm ruthless about getting rid of friction, there's no game left. For me, the practice of game design is the practice of thoughtfully using friction to create a great experience. So here's the conclusion we're left with, and I think the belief system we're given. Friction in games, good. Friction in products, bad. Let's start with the friction in games part. Absolutely, that's true. That's what creates emotional moments like this. So this is uh, one of my boys, and we're playing a game, Kahuna, and he is engaged in this, and he's got to make a complex choice. And yeah, there's a lot of friction. And you look at this game, Kahuna, and even though it's got this theme pasted on of we're both warring gods, you know, fighting over these, these islands, when you actually peel back the layers, this game is a math problem. 
It's a math problem. You're trying to math out things and how many connections you have between these islands. It's, it's, uh, this is what the game really is on the right, but it's got this theme on, and it's, it's, it's got this fun friction, this fun challenge. So what about the friction in products equals bad? Well, let's go back to that Raf Koster quote. Um, he said, UX design is about removing problems from the user, which is a popular sentiment going back as far as books like Don't Make Me Think. Um, whereas game design is about giving problems to the user. And, you know, this sentiment says these things are very separate, and this is the distinction. I would disagree. I would say, yes, a lot of what we do is removing friction, and yes, game design are about friction, but is there a middle ground where if what we're working on is a learning challenge, uh, would it not benefit from being more game-like or playful? And so kind of how I say this in a different way is I take the premise of don't make me think, and I would say, yeah, don't make me think about the wrong stuff. Don't make me think about the interface. Don't make me think about usability things. But about the critical stuff, the content, we should be thinking. And I ask, is there a learning or understanding problem involved, or should there be? And I think here as designers, we have a philosophical question that we need to wrestle with. And I think it's illustrated in this next example. I went to Tokyo earlier this year, and this is the Tokyo uh, subway system, uh, incredibly complex. And if you were a designer building you know, an app for this, I think we have a question to ask ourselves. And it's fundamentally, do we help people master the train system, or do we help people not think about it? And I think the answer is, like many things, it depends. So if someone's traveling to Tokyo and they're only going to be there for a couple days, uh, then yeah, you don't, they don't need to think about it. They don't need to understand or master the Tokyo subway system. You know, they can fire up Google now and Google can tell me where I need to get off and where I need to go next. And that's okay. But if I'm going to stay in Tokyo for three weeks, three months, if I'm going to live there, should I have a mental model of the system? Should I know this one goes in a loop and these are in the major regions? Absolutely. And so at that point, I would say, are we designing tools that remove all that thought and that understanding, or are we designing tools that help people engage with that and form a mental model and understand the system and master it? And I don't, frankly, see a lot of this going on in what work we do. I don't see us framing things as learning challenges and helping people learn, I see us shying away from that and saying, let's remove all that thinking and do it for you. Let's outsource that to these algorithms and these black box things that you can't see. We'll just take care of it for you so you can just go about your business and, and get from point A to point B. And I look around and a lot of the work I see, I think we would be better if we engaged with the learning challenge. So things like choosing the best health insurance plan for me and my family, Instead of an algorithm and boiling it down to two or three options and saying, here are the ones we recommend, what if you help me understand the dozens of options and help me make the best choice and help me understand why I made that choice? Understanding privacy policies on websites, understanding what does all this mean, what am I agreeing to? I think that's a huge design problem that no one is taking on. Understanding any kind of legal agreement for that matter. Choosing the best loan payment option, understanding the terms and how to best manage that. Purchasing any big expensive item like a TV or a car. Uh, planning a vacation, dreaming about the vacation. Choosing healthy food options. These are all learning challenges where, frankly, I don't want to see tools that do all the thinking for me. I want to see tools that help me think better and engage with this content. And so here's how I think about this. I think game experiences create learning challenges to make something a fun and interesting game, so they add friction. I think product ex experiences today remove or simplify the learning challenges, remove that friction, in order to increase efficiencies, conversion rates, task completion, to make things easier. I think product experiences could reframe things as learning challenges or as playful things in order to create awesome users. And if you roll this forward to what's it doing to us as individuals, well, I think there's a time and place to simplify things for people. And what it does there is it outsources all that thinking that maybe we don't need to do to you know, these systems, these algorithms. And I think in many contexts, that's OK. But for a lot of these learning contexts where we should be engaging with the content, when we take that away, what we're doing is we are taking away people's power to make informed, empowered 
choices about really difficult things. And I think that's the wrong thing to do. We need to empower people to make these informed choices, make people awesome. So I want to go back to this quote from Randy Hoyt. Uh, he said, people play games for no productive reason. You go out of your way to put up with unnecessary obstacles. But here's what he went on to say. But, you know, people do enjoy things that are not easy to learn. There's a sense of accomplishment. Most things are rewarding. Most things that are rewarding aren't easy to do. Within UX, there's a lot to be said for other kinds of experiences, not just the usability or how quick something is to learn. So here's my challenge to you. In what ways is your work about more than ease of use or efficiency? Is there a learning challenge inherent in the experience you're working on? And if so, could this learning challenge be reframed as a playful learning experience? And that leads me to one final comment um, that's not here, but it's kind of, as you can see, something I'm pretty passionate about, and that's learning through play. Uh, I gave a talk several years ago that was, for my career, my defining moment, where I, things came into focus, what kind of designer I wanted to be. And it was when I started looking at games, I started looking at education models, I started looking at, at these different areas, and I realized there's fundamentally three different things. There are paths, there are loops, and there are sandboxes. And so if you look at a game like Candy Crush, it's a progression-based, level-based game. And, uh, and that's it, right? If you look at something like Minecraft, it's a sandbox where the game designer sets some basic rules in place, put some objects in there, and then the people have done amazing things that the creators could have never anticipated. And then loops are games like board games where we play over and over again, and we see patterns, and we learn things. And if I look at this through the learning lens, with paths, it ends in an exchange. I give you my time, I give you my money, you give me some satisfaction or enjoyment for a little bit. And you know, there's a place for paths, but does that really encourage me to engage with content, to learn, to grow, to stretch? You know, I don't think so. You look at sandboxes, and sandboxes end in learning through discovery and construction, the maker model, the, mind, the maker mindset, constructing things, learning through all these amazing hands-on activities. And even loops, it's kind of like a path on itself, Loops are pretty much how the brain works, right? We, we learn to recognize patterns. And so you play something over enough and you start to see patterns and see, uh, get pattern recognition and learn what works, what doesn't. And so that leads to, you know, leads to kind of my, my uh, I can't, the things I'm, I'm obsessed about and what I do. I think games, play, simulations, role playing, making, I think these can all be powerful tools for learning. But I think more than ever, we need new tools and systems to help us understand each other and the world we live in. And I think more than ever, especially with changes in the world that are happening right now, we need tools to help us explore complex topics through safe, playful interactions. And I look at things like uh, what Nikki Case or Brett Victor are doing with explorable explanations. And on the surface, it's light and fun and playful. This is uh, uh, something called, uh, it's the shapes of, I can't remember the exact name, but you're playing with these shapes, these triangles, these squares, and there's some simple rules, and you move the triangles around, and you move the squares around. You're trying to make these little shapes happy. What you're doing is you're playing with a system. And she took a paper, from the early 1970s by a Nobel Prize winning author all about desegregation. These really complex thoughts and she's brought it to life in this fun, playful, interactive game. But you start playing with the game and you realize, oh crap, like what seemed like some simple rules that everyone would be happy with actually creates dissatisfaction and the game ultimately trends towards desegregation. This is not good. And you're playing with these really complex ideas but in a safe, fun way, and suddenly you're thinking differently about the world. And so I look at things like this, and I think this is awesome for what it does for me as an individual, but what if we could actually take these games to the next level and do them collectively? So you bring your worldview, I bring my worldview, we start playing together in a safe space, and we start to understand different viewpoints, and we start to have healthy conversations about things we might otherwise disagree about. And I think that leads to the biggest change I've experienced over the last four or five years. If you'd grabbed me a few years ago, I would have talked a lot about changing hearts and minds, 
telling compelling stories to get people aligned around a vision. And that's all good and it sounds great, but implicit in that is that I know what's best and I'm trying to convince you. And what I've learned over time is to really, that other people have valuable opinions and judgments as well. And so my mantra now is really work and learn together to enter into a conversation or an interaction assuming that you know as much if not more than I do and let's work and learn together and let's create a shared emergent mental model by doing so. So, we started off with board games. We ended up with some pretty heavy stuff here. Thought it would end on a light note. This is me playing a game uh, at my house uh, called Pie in the Face. <laughs> and you can't hear the audio, but my kids are just cracking up and laughing. All right. Thank you very much, and go play some games. Hey, Steven. Super cool. Uh, we have some great questions. Thank you for submitting. Um, and we have just a, a few minutes. How do you All feel right. about a, a question or two? Sure. Uh, Lucas asks, could we say that lean and game design are not compatible? Lean and game design? Yeah. No, I think they are. I mean, the fundamental premise of lean is these rapid iterative learning experiments. I mean, that is core to it. And I think that's what happens when you're doing uh, game design is it's all about learning. And I think as long as we can remember lean isn't about shipping necessarily, it's about learning. And that may involve shipping, but the focus is not to create a scalable product. It's mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. learn and iterate, then I think they're, they're entirely compatible. Uh, Mauro asks, um, will virtual extended reality replace only cardboard-based board games? Uh, I, I actually don't think so. I think there's something fundamentally human about tangible things and having stuff you can touch and feel. That's the whole tactility part that I didn't talk about. Uh, I think it's more likely that we'll see this hybrid interaction where we, we have board game pieces, but the boring part of setting up a game maybe is accelerated through augmented reality or other things. Mm -hmm. uh, or in games, like what makes a good game is a choice, a difficult choice. What doesn't make a fun game is calculations, like when you're, which, what should I do? And so I think, imagine now I'm wearing these VR goggles and I can hover pieces around and the calculations are being done on the fly, but I still have to make the difficult choice. I think that will make a game that's much more enjoyable. So a hybrid. Uh, Tim asks, when increasing fidelity as early as you describe, mm -hmm. how do you ensure you still build as fast and cheap as with lower fidelity? Yeah, so I think that's the key, and that assumes you can build at a high fidelity or higher fidelity very quickly. And I think the state of the tools we have today and the state of frameworks and like pattern libraries and all this stuff, I think it allows us to build and get to a high fidelity in hours, like if not minutes in some cases. And I've actually pulled up, you know, going back several years ago, I had a keynote library template and I would actually sit up next to a client and rather than take notes or even draw on the whiteboard, just capture what they were saying in real time in keynote and we would leave the meeting with a high fidelity mock-up. So I think it, the speed is definitely an important part. So it's not about time to get to fidelity, it's getting to high fidelity in a, in a low cost fashion. Uh-huh, got it, okay. Um, Maybe one more. Okay. Joshua asks, how much does the experience of the work environment creep into product and game design? The experience of the work environment. Yeah, so I guess what the, the question might be, if I can dare to interpret, is uh, uh, what if you're working on an agile team mm -hmm. uh, that may be a bit engineering heavy? How do you work this attitude and this playfulness in? Yeah, so these are the conversations that are happening all around. And it might, like, at, I'll use my own company as a reference. I'm not necessarily talking about directly about these things in game design, but what I am talking about is are we separating out a learning phase or a making to think phase from a building to ship phase? Because mm -hmm. those are different things. And so I'm talking about these ideas, just not explicitly or directly so. And so if you talk about learning experiments as separate from ship, like, it's the same ideas. 
Got it. Especially well, on the prototyping part. So. Stephen, thank you so much. And uh, if, you, you, if you have any energy left after this, there's a speaker lounge, and others may have questions for sure. you. I'll, so I'll maybe we'll find you way. there. Okay, All very right. good. Thank you. Thank you. Please.